The Miracles and Prophecies of St. John Bosco, a project of America Needs Fatima. I'm your host, Matthew Miller. St. John Bosco and the Conversion of a Jew One day in 1847, as Don Bosco was making the rounds in St. John's Hospital in Turin, the Mother Superior, Sister Seraphim, told him of a Jewish patient in his early 20s who seemed interested in becoming a Christian. Don Bosco gave the nuns some wise suggestions on how to begin religious instruction without getting into any controversy. In her friendly talks with the young man, Sister Seraphim, among other things, told him about Don Bosco, and especially of his fatherly care for boys, pointing out what he had done and was doing for their welfare in Turin. The young man listened with growing interest and soon became quite anxious to meet Don Bosco. A few days later, Sister Seraphim, who had invited Don Bosco beforehand, went to the patient's room and said, I have some good news. I think Don Bosco has just come in and is making the rounds in our ward. If you want to meet him, I'll introduce him to you. I'm sure his visit will do you good. Yes, of course, I'd be very glad to see him, replied the young man. As Don Bosco came into his room, the young man arose from his chair and politely removed his cap. Something about his gentle, refined appearance hinted at a secret sorrow. After a few questions, Don Bosco sensed that he was dealing with a sensitive youth of sterling qualities. This first visit was a short one, but it paved the way for many others, longer and spiritually fruitful. As the young man came to know Don Bosco better, he began to feel a deep liking for him and told him his life story. His name was Abraham, and he had been born in Amsterdam of wealthy parents. Very intelligent, a top student, and the idol of his family, he had easy access to amusements, travel, and comforts. Nevertheless, he had always led a decent, upright life. Abraham had an older sister, Rachel, of whom he was very fond. She secretly desired to become a Christian. From books on religion, which she read secretly or through contact with some Catholics, Rachel had learned about our faith and was gradually influencing her brother Abraham with Christian principles without his awareness. A few years older than her brother, Rachel, at 17, told her father that she wanted to become a Catholic and a sister of charity and asked his permission to go to France for that purpose. Her request infuriated him. Unable to shake her from her resolve, he forbade her to leave until she became of age. When that time came, he couldn't stop her, but he disinherited her and refused to give her any means of support. Her aunt, however, also Jewish, felt sorry for the girl and provided her dowry for admission to St. Vincent de Paul's Sisters of Charity in Paris. When Abraham learned that his sister wanted to become a Catholic and a nun, he took a sudden, bitter, violent dislike to her in the belief that she no longer cared for him. Nevertheless, the Christian principles she had instilled into him were strong enough to keep alive in him some gnawing doubts about his own faith. Abraham's mother was quick to grasp his misgivings. In order to strengthen his faith, she would often tell him stories from the Talmud to impress upon him the terrible punishments visited upon Jews who changed their religion. But Abraham gave them little credence and kept repeating, why should I fear a witch who you say lived in the days of Adam? This is most likely the dreaded Lilith of Jewish lore. He said, if she still exists, as you claim, she must be pretty old by now, and so I don't think she can do me any harm. Abraham's father, who was quite superstitious, seeing his favorite son stray further and further from his ancestral faith, and at times even belittle some of its precepts, called in a learned rabbi to show him his error. Abraham's intelligence, however, gave the rabbi a hard time, especially when they discussed the eternal kingdom promised by God to David. He asked the rabbi where this kingdom was at the present time, repeatedly quoting Moses as saying, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the staff from between his feet, until he, the Messiah, comes to whom it belongs, as it says in Genesis. Now if the Messiah has not yet come, insisted Abraham, where is our kingdom of Judah? And if the kingdom of Judah is no more, isn't that a sign that the Messiah has already come? Try as he might, the rabbi was unable to answer him convincingly on this point. 
The father loved Abraham as a favorite child. Seeing his constant restlessness and deep interest in religion, he sent him to Protestant ministers in the hope that they would clear his doubts and satisfy his intellectual curiosity without endangering his faith. It was useless, for they rather tried to draw him to their own persuasion. Abraham wasn't impressed. He considered a religion without sacrifice or ritual, without unity and unquestioned doctrine, as no religion at all. In their determination to win him over, they undermined his morals, and unfortunately, Abraham was too weak to resist. As a result of his dissolute life, he contracted a pulmonary disease. As soon as the first symptoms appeared, Abraham developed a violent hatred against the Christian faith, realizing that the cause of his disease lay in the evil advice he had received. He complained bitterly to his father for having referred him to those ministers, but his father answered, "'You wanted to know about Christianity, and I sent you to its teachers.' In Amsterdam, at that time, Christian meant Protestant. Such were the courts, the churches, and society in general. Catholics were so few and unknown that he had never even heard of them or their religion. When his sister Rachel had turned Christian, Abraham had assumed that she had joined the Protestants. As his illness persisted, his parents decided to send him to Vienna for treatment by the most renowned physicians. There he spent some time in several hospitals, receiving the best and most expensive care. Since there was no improvement, the doctors decided to try a change of climate and sent him first to Innsbruck and then to Turin. The illness was now clearly diagnosed as tuberculosis. At first, some wealthy Jewish relatives of his welcomed him, but then, fearing for the health of their own children, they sent him to Chieti where his condition progressively worsened. He had to go back to his relatives in Turin, and after a few days, they set him up in a private room at St. John's Hospital. It was here that he had the good fortune to meet Don Bosco. In his first visits, Don Bosco made no mention of religion. He broached the subject only after he was sure of the boy's friendship. Abraham then realized his error in identifying Christianity with Protestantism, and he couldn't help admiring the beauty of Catholic doctrine. Soon, however, his family learned of Don Bosco's long visits and took steps to prevent their son's conversion. They hired private nurses to watch him day and night, and from then on, it became very difficult for Don Bosco to visit Abraham and discuss religion with him. At first, the young man was rather distressed, but soon he found out that one of the nurses spoke only French and German whereas he spoke English perfectly, as did Sister Seraphim. So they agreed to continue his religious instruction in English, with neither of the nurses being the wiser for it. Don Bosco coached Sister Seraphim and provided her with suitable books, such as Paolo de' Medici's Talks to the Jews and The Jews by Father Vincenzo Rosso, two works intended to prove that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, had already come. The two nurses couldn't understand a word of what was being said, but, suspecting what was afoot, told their employer, to whom Abraham's father had given explicit orders to prevent the boy's conversion to Catholicism. As a result, they tried to move him again to Chieti, but not even the offer of a generous recompense could overcome the reluctance of the families there to accept the patient in their homes. Meanwhile, the illness was approaching its terminal stage, and Abraham's relatives kept a close watch. After being informed of his turn for the worse, the father ordered his son returned to Amsterdam, no matter what the consequences. The doctors, however, refused to comply. The patient was so weak and so little life remained in him that he would have surely died on the trip. At last, his kin in Turin, realizing that nothing could save him, overcome by their fear of dying, made themselves scarce and left him alone. Seizing the propitious moment, Father Rossi, the chaplain, baptized Abraham, gave him first communion, and administered the anointing of the sick at two in the morning. His relatives were told nothing. A few days later, Don Bosco was on his way to pay Abraham a visit when a patient in one of the wards asked him, "'Are you by any chance going to see Abraham?' "'Yes.' 
He died last night. The young man had been in the hospital six months. 35 years later, Don Bosco happened to be in Paris. He called on the Sisters of Charity and asked whether in their convent there was a nun from Amsterdam, a convert from the Jewish faith. Yes, Sister Rachel is still here, said the sister who opened the door. Would you kindly tell her I have some news of her brother? Her brother? Did he die as a Catholic then? His sister did hear some rumors to that effect, but nothing definite. I can vouch for it. When may I see Sister Rachel? Well, could you come to say Mass for us tomorrow? In the meantime, I'll tell Sister Superior. How thrilled Sister Rachel will be. Don Bosco kept his appointment. Rachel was overjoyed at meeting the priest who had been the Lord's instrument in leading her dear brother to his eternal salvation. She now learned that the seed she had sown so many years before had borne the fruit of everlasting life. Don Bosco said Mass and preached. It was indeed a day of great joy for Sister Rachel and the whole community. Thank you all so much for watching, and if you'd like to hear more stories about conversions, just click on this video here or this video here. God bless you, and Our Lady keep you.